Yeah, so I'm just going to continue third um, installment of the uh, landscape architecture lecture series this semester with the overarching title inclusion. And so we had two lectures um, already, one dealing with gender aspects, another one dealing with plants. And today's lecture will, um, will actually come to uh, non-human animals. And before I introduce uh, today's speakers, I just want to draw your attention to uh, the last lecture of uh, the semester, which will occur on December 2nd, also in B3. And we'll have Taiza Wei as our speaker. She's a professor um, at the University of Washington and also the director of Garden and Landscape Studies um, at the Dumberton Oaks Research um, collection, uh, library and uh, collection in Washington, DC. And she will, in fact, also be uh, speaking about um, some of the aspects of gender and race in early uh, landscape architecture, um, mostly here in the United States. So, but today we are actually zooming our lecturer in from Assam in India where he is at the moment and where it is 3.30 or 3.40 a.m. in the morning. So um, we're incredibly grateful, Man, that you, you, you've agreed to do this live with us today and for us. So um, Man Barua is a university lecturer in, in human geography at the University of Cambridge in the UK. And before joining the faculty at the University of Cambridge, Mann was a British Academy postdoctoral fellow at the University of Oxford. Um, he, his uh, research focuses on the economies, ontologies, and politics of the living and material world. He is interested in developing new conversations between critical political economy and post-humanism through um, three areas of inquiry. One of them, urban ecologies, also lively capital and biodiversity conservation. His research um, and current research uh, revolves around urban ecology and seeks to develop new insights into metropolitan life, especially by looking at the relationships between non-human worlds, infrastructures, metabolism, and urban biopolitics. And this has actually already culminated in a book entitled Living Cities, The Urban in a Minor Key, which will be published in 2022 by Duke University Press. Um, Mon is also a principal investigator on a very big project on urban ecologies funded by the European Research Council. And this project is focused on a variety of topics related to the urban ecologies of Delhi, um, Guwahati, and London. And so, um, Man, I think we're all very curious uh, to learn from you tonight. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Ban Barua. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sonia, for the invitation. And um, hello from Assam uh, to everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking, you know, partly um, from a chapter of the, of the forthcoming book. And, you know, the, the subtitle of this talk is, is, is very similar to the one I have for my book. Um, but let me start, um, and kind of going back to April 2016, when the upmarket business district of Delhi's Connaught Place and Janpat had a sudden power outage. It lasted several hours. A troop of macaques scrap. A troop of macaques scrambled down concrete high rises to nick food from a street vendor. Upon being chased, the animals clambered up pipes to reach safer heights before crossing a busy road via a high tension cable wire. Amidst the commotion, one animal fell onto the main transformer connecting the power grid. It sparked a shock short circuit. A crowd soon assembled, some trying to figure out what the commotion was about Others irate about a blackout in the April heat. This is the second time in 18 months that monkeys have caused a power breakdown, complained the owner of an apparel store. Emergency repair staff was called in, but they were unable to remove the electrocuted macaque as other members of its natal troop 
prevented people from getting clothes. Almost every rooftop in the vicinity had macaques displaying aggression towards onlookers, especially repair staff desperately trying to remove the electrocuted animal. It was hours before electricity supply was restored. Delhi's rhesus macaque population has proliferated in the last three decades, sometimes referred to as the city's monkey menace in, in the popular press and in government circulars. These animals are at the center of a whole set of controversies about urban inhabitation and belonging. But macaques' abilities to negotiate the city draws from their enmeshment with an infrastructural environment, pipes, cables, buildings, and walls, which the animals repurpose for their own mobilities and dwelling. When macaques trigger power outages, they pose a whole set of questions about the material and, po and political life of infrastructure, albeit not in ways commonplace in what is an exploding literature on the subject in the social sciences. We might therefore ask, what might it mean to ecologize infrastructure, to bring to the fore some of the elusive relations that constitute urban form, its mode of inhabitation and its attendant economies. What does such an approach, which is rooted um, in these e ecological relations, offer up for querying urban theory and its grammars? And if we take Ashamin and Nigel Tritt's observation that cities everywhere are orchestrated by both human and non-human means, then what accounts of material and political life of the relations between macaques and infrastructure come to the fore? Urban life worlds, one could argue, can be seen as becoming infrastructural in all its dimensions, from the economic to the cultural and the political. Much of the innovative work on infrastructure, and I'm here kind of referring to, um, you know, a vast literature, but mainly say, for example, in, in anthropology, it tends to ex examine how claims to staples, including water, electricity, and sanitation, provide what Hannah Appel and colleagues call a new ethnographic and analytical frame to defamiliarize and rethink the political. As technologies of enchantment, promising, promising economic prosperity, development, and modernity, Infrastructures shape experiences of everyday life. They are sites of social and material claims where questions of urban citizenship are produced, contested, and even revealed. The literature on infrastructure, especially in anthropology, but also in geography, um, argues that politics surrounding infrastructure is increasingly molded in a techno-political field that consists of a relation with a gamut of things, whether they are pipes, energy grids or roads. And yet, these analyses often revert to a major urban grammar. The political is recast in terms of identity and the categories mobilized often foreclose who inhabits or belongs to the city. A retinue of other than human beings that graft and contest what it means to be urban sometimes go missing. So a common theme on work on infrastructure, a mantra even, is breakdown and the kinds of life to which breakdown gives rise. Infrastructures, as Brian Larkin writes, bleed. However, as the instance of the macaque shows, infrastructures can bleed in multivalent and unexpected ways. Power outages stripped by macaques can render visible dispersed geographies of the city. In June 2011, newspapers reported how a park power line tripped by a macaque in East Delhi's IP extension sparked power cuts in several residential localities, Lajpatnagar, Maharani Bagh, New Friends Colony, much to the south of the city. The event brought the complexity of infrastructural provisioning into relief from transmitters to distributors and their attendant bureaucracies. Staff of Delhi Transco Limited, a public sector enterprise responsible for transmitting power, remarked how they first tried isolating the system by stopping the flow of power when the macaque entered their supply substation. After dodging attempts of being caught for almost half an hour, the macaque inadvertently got tangled in electric cables. Not only did the unfortunate animal get electrocuted, but two transformers of 1,000 megavolt amperes each also tripped. Delhi Transco therefore was forced to cut power supplies. Disruptions, however, can be much more mundane, 
folded into the pulse of the everyday. Macaques destroy plants, but they don't stop there, remarks a resident of a, um, you know, of, of, of a res resident colony in Delhi. Electric cables, bichantene, CCTV cameras, telephone wires, and even PNG fittings are not left alone. They move about with the help of wires. A mishap can lead to a situation that is life-threatening to people. Torn wires and cables are a frequent complaint in Delhi. Ethnographic attention shows that this is not simply the outcome of macaque's mobilities, but is influenced by a range of currents that animate the modernist city. Macaques have become a serious point of contention in Delhi's Tisazari, or lower court complex, where they have begun to hinder the installation of internet infrastructure. The animal's presence around courts is fostered through a regular provisioning by those who are involved in litigation. Pe people who are caught up in generally long-winded and protracted judicial processes in Indian courts often pray to Lord Hanuman, as he is known as Sankat Mochan, or the reliever from misfortune. Offering food to macaques is a means of appeasing Hanuman, an endeavor to obtain liberation from distress and disputes. Infrastructural disruptions happen as a result of this concatenated, concatenated ecology. Macaques are seen as intermediaries, summoning supernatural powers, and provisioning means that the animals then start to associate courts with food. As a result, and in the words of the Secretary of Delhi's Bar Association, macaques are not only damaging the court's records, but sometimes files and documents are found strewn in the corridors and power cables containing sensitive data are found snapped. Yet, making sense of these entanglements between other than human ecologies and infrastructure through the language of breakdown is limiting. In this sense, macaques would only be seen as a transgressive force whose destructive acts bring quotidian relations with infrastructure, otherwise withdrawn into the background hum of urban life, into sharp relief. The analytic of breakdown, I would argue, forecloses other questions that might be asked about the material life of urban infrastructure. Asking such questions requires developing what I call a minor ecology of infrastructure to express social and material claims about infrastructure in a register that sees cities as ensembles of human and other than human rhythms and which gather a multitude of other stories vibrating within the urban. The minor does not come from a minor language, but to quote from Deleuze and Guattari's short treatise on Kafka, the minor is that which a minority constructs within a major language. The minor, therefore, is about expression in cramped space. And by cramped space, spaces, I'm referring to the language of the urban canon asc ascendant in the Western tradition, as well as an urban theory from the global south, much of which is a major key. And in this key, or in the major key, infrastructure is refracted through a notion of design that is hylomorphic, or the stamping of form upon inert matter. Hylomorphism, as, as a lot of you will be familiar, derives from the Aristotelian idea that to create anything, one has to impose form, morph, upon matter, hyl, an idea that has become deeply embedded in urban grammar from architecture to art, design to technology, policy to planning. Hylomorphism imagines the urban environment to be an outcome of the activity of building, giving primacy to a world laid out by humans for their use and in advance of who or what inhabits it. In this view, macaque's actions would result in variance, phenomena or events, and um, here I'm referring to macaque's actions, say, in disrupting something like the infrastructure grid or the electric grid. Um, and, and these kind of events would be seen as events that deviate from intended script. A minor practice, on the other hand, is to rework a major language from within. It is about formulating concepts and denominations of the urban canon differently. But the minor does not stand apart from the major, and we cannot have one thing without the other. The minor always trails the major like a thing and its shadow, even though the latter is routinely suppressed. The, ma the major and minor are therefore two different treatments of the same urban language. One consists in extracting constants, where the hu 
human assumes the standard measure and the urban frame of reference, and the other places these in continuous variation. I argue that work on infrastructure is written predominantly in a major key, and as such, it is incomplete, cleaved with the minor practices that are inventive, making and remaking urban life. A minor ecology, therefore, is about production and the proliferation of one, what one could call polyvalent and connect, collective connections. Polyvalent as connections are brought about by heterogeneous agents and polyvalent, a word which comes from Valencia, meaning power or compet competence, as it includes a range of competencies of which the human is one among many. Take, for instance, the quotidian rhythms of Macaques and Connaught Place, Delhi's premier business hub, where much, where much of my fieldwork took place. Architectural features of the city become part of Macaques' urban worlds, as does a range of provisioning infrastructure. They use overhead, overhead storage tanks dotted across most high rises in, in the metropolis to bathe. Monkeys have learned to open their covers, and if the plastic water tanks are empty, they even knock them off our terrace, says Rashid, who has installed locks on his storage tank to prevent the macaques from getting into them. Taps become reliable sources of drinking water in an urban environment where basic staples, and fresh water is a staple for macaques too, are localized and scarce. The animals not only know where taps are located within their territories, but some, though not all, have learned how to open them with ease. Using um, usually left running, precious water goes to waste, much to the chagrin of residents. People respond, therefore, to macaque infrastructure and enmeshments. As you can see in this image, taps can be replaced with a different design so that water does not go to waste. The city, therefore, brims with these small stories of other ebbs and flows, which are easily blotted out in mainstream accounts of urban life and infrastructure. In fact, a video of, uh, I'm going to play, of a video of one individual closing a tap after use went viral on the internet, sparking speculative anthropomorphized memes on macaque's proclivity for water conservation. While it's difficult to apprehend what sparked the individual to do so, and whether closing taps could in the future become a skill macaques acquire, if they understand that it reduces an antagonism from people, the dexterity and neophilia macaques exhibit are reflective of the competencies the animals develop when inhabiting complex urban worlds. Macaques also bring novel architectural and infrastructural labyrinths into being. The polyvalent connections macaques draw involve what the ecological psychologist James Gibson calls affordances, what an environment or thing furnishes an animal. Affordances are relational, they are not merely physical properties, but neither are they colla collapsible to a sentient subject. Rather, affordances imply complementarity between perceiver and perceived. In Delhi, macaques have in fact begun to shift from a rural terrestriality to what I would call an urban arboreality. But the rooftops and the concrete buildings, which from the macaque's viewpoint can be seen to be another kind of um, terrestrial grounds. So There's a kind of inversion of the, of the city that you might see to the way they realize these affordances. The landscape that so emerges is akin to what the urban geographer Matthew Gandhi calls unintentional landscapes, landscapes in spite of themselves. But we might push this thought a bit further. The notion of unintentional rests on a distinction between what the scholastics termed essentia, the essence of an object, and accidentia, or properties that arise by chance. What determines the distinction between essence and accident is the nature of the bond between the object and a person. Infrastructural labyrinths of the city become unintentional landscapes when the frame of reference is human design or who forms those bonds is taken as a given. But if, if one were to replace a human with a macaque or shift the frame of reference to a meshwork ecology where there's no centralized panoptic eye, which encounters constitute an answer an urban landscape and what relations give rise to its characteristics, designed or accidental, is re-envisioned. 
In Connaught Place and in Old Delhi, it is not unusual to see macaques crossing streets or making their ways into buildings via cables. The tangle of overhead wires as though a giant spider has woven its way through the city can leave a first time visitor spellbound. Sohail Hashmi, a commentator on Delhi, calls this meshwork muck with colonial legacies, whose proliferation rests on what he calls native genius in the form of illicit tapping. The meshwork is an, and to quote Hashmi, is an unholy mess used by armies of monkeys on their daily journeys in search of food. There is a politics of aesthetics here, and this is vital in fact for a whole drive to try and remove macaques from the city, a theme that I, I can't go into depth today, but you might have to wait for the book. Um, but however, looking at these overhead wires and the ways in which they proliferate, raveling here, unraveling there, is vital for understanding how arboreal urban worlds of macaques emerge. The city of Delhi's electric infrastructure is preceded by a complex history of stately rituals, political action, and legal struggles. Equally, its proliferation and growth has been about hooking onto the energy grid via improvised and often unauthorized connections. The morphology of the Delhi Electropolis is the product, I would argue, of two sets of forces, the expansion of informal settlements and their claims to energy supply, as well as the state's attempt to regulate infrastructural access. Delhi witnessed the privatization of its state-run electricity supply and distribution in the early 2000s. Reforms were aimed at addressing this content over insufficient coverage that plagued delivery, um, which and also which grew out of a rapid spread in unplanned settlements, and with them increased demands on, on the energy grid. Newly set up distribution companies, this comes as they are called, rapidly expand, expanded into the unplanned settlements, partly to curtail high rates of theft, theft and distribution losses, but also to expand their consumer base. Unique numbers were assigned to each household, and if connections were illegal, they were regular, regularized through newly installed electric meters. And as a tacit means of assimilation, the regularization of connections brings marginalized populations into the ambit of state surveillance and capital. However, challenges posed by the operative geom geometries of electrification, including inefficiencies in coordination, differences in sectorial logics, or a lack of planning, mean that this comes a caught between implementing directives of Delhi's urban master plan and attending to informal urbanization. For instance, substations and transformers are frequently installed on berms of roads, often the only available land in settlements with limited space and a high population density. Unplanned expansion of buildings, including extensions such as balconies, and, um, they encroach upon electricity equipment and breach stipulated minimum distances from electric infrastructure. Such architectonic outgrowths makes it easy for illegal connections, typically clandestine non-metered graphs onto a transmission line to be devised. Arguing against narratives of failed planning, the scholar Ananya Roy um, states that informality is a planning regime, an instrument of both accumulation and authority in India. Informal, informality is a deregulated rather than an unregulated domain, not necessarily a, a grassroots phenomenon running parallel to the formal and the legal, but a mode of discipline, power, and regulation existing at the very heart of the state. The analytical filter of informal urbanism, however, I would argue, falls short in attending to some of the currents witnessed here, notably how infrastructure becomes an arboreal more than human world. And for this, we need to turn to minor practices. Hooking onto the grid through illicit wires, sometimes called katiyas in the vernacular, put in place by a katiya baz, professionals who purloin electricity, is a glaring example. The practice of rerouting electricity, one could argue, is akin to drawing lines with wires, an act through which the electric meshwork proliferates. Minor practices of the urban electrician, or katiya baz, subvert state power and its, attentive, and its attendant hylomorphic matter form model from which state power derives. Here, ideas and laws assume a model's coherence, 
Engineers operate with laws of voltage, capacity, frequency, and load, and they're therefore submitting matter to specific form. In contrast to the engineer, the katiabas or the urban electrician or the vernacular electrician is a bricolo operating through rules of thumb, but not subordinating these to laws and a matter form model. The katia or the graph, which is hooked onto the grid, is not so much a connector. Rather, it is a graft, a wire that is grown with the electric meshwork joining in to its generative flows. Whilst engineers and the state seek to prepare matter for form, the minor practice of the katiabas is to work with materials and forces. The katiabas continu continually rearranges wires in new and different patterns or configurations. No matter how strong the winds are, or even if there is a monsoon storm, my katiyas will not budge, proclaims Loha Singh, the protagonist of the evocative documentary Katia Bars on Electric Theft. It's, it, this is a wonderful film, which I would really, really recommend um, people interested in, in informal urbanization um, to, to look at. But through improvisation, the Katia Bars also invents other affects, arboreal affects felt and sensed by macaques. The animal's patterned mobility along electric wires renders the meshwork into a tactile space or a haptic space, um, which is much more about touch than it is about vision. Macaque's movements through, electric, through the electric grid are now beginning to have bearings on the work of infrastructure providers. When simians get electrocuted or entangled in wires, the attention of closely related members of their natal troop is quickly drawn. To protect their kin, uh, kin, the latter prevent repair teams from disentangling the animal, often attacking linemen and onlookers, making it unsafe for them to work. Infrastructure providers now increasingly collaborate with wildlife rescue NGOs, drawing on the latter's expertise in dealing with macaques. Such situations suggest that a broader infrastructural ontology, which recognizes rather than effaces animal infrastructure enfleshments, is already being borne out in the lived city, where the practice of infrastructure repair is also about responding to other than human affects. So in Delhi, DISCOMs have come up with a number of steps to suppress minor practices. This includes the installation of new meters that measure something called power factor, a relationship between voltage and current. Highly altered power factors enable detecting whether electricity is being purloined from other sources. In 2017, DISCOMS filed close to 4,000 complaints of power thefts, and nearly 3,000 cases were registered with the Delhi police. Completely removing theft, as the policeman remarks, is not practically feasible. There are numerous administrative and operational reasons, and exact connections are often hard to locate at a time of a raid. Furthermore, local strongmen intervene and hinder officials from carrying out raids, and the Katia Bas takes advantage of the confusion of the tangles of wires to graph connections that elude state and corporate surveillance. Why should I be scared of the government when electric current does not scare me, asks Loha Singh in this documentary, um, Katia Bas, and he mocks the government by pur purloining electricity. So providing illegal connections for a living is a risky and hazard, hazardous vocation, but it's also an intrapolitical activity, a strategy of resisting power laws, bypassing state scrutiny without open contestation. During the course of my fieldwork, several households in the lower middle class colony in, uh, in the lower middle class Delhi Development Authority residential colony resorted to abandoning the new electricity meters the SCOMs had installed. They argued that macaques had developed the habit of ripping them off. What monkeys get out of destroying meters, we can't tell, remarked the resident. But they play with the devices for a while and then leave them only to steal another. When complaints were put forward to police authorities, they remarked, the police remarked that theft laws were for humans, not for monkeys. BCS Rajdhani, the local power supplier, apparently had to re replace more than 50 damaged, miss missing, or damaged or missing meters. And whilst it is difficult to fathom as to whether macaques were the sole cause of missing meters 
for it was highly plausible that they were surreptitiously removed by people, there's little doubt that other than human agents can get enrolled into subversive acts. Indeed, one could say there's much more to heaven and earth than is dreamt of in the Discom's philosophy. Other than human agents summoned to make infrastructural claims can extend to the spectral as witnessed in Delhi's famous episode of the Monkey Man. In the summer month of May 2001, an elusive monkey-like creature attacked and injured a number of people at night, and mainly during events of power failure in working class settlements in Ghaziabad and the east of Delhi. It was a monkey all right, about four foot tall, remarked the victim, but as soon as I grabbed it, it turned into a cat with tawny glowing eyes. The assailant morphed over time from a macaque to a mutant cyborg by the time of by the time the scare became rampant and the number of incidents increased in Delhi. Forensic reports from psychiatrists later concluded that the monkey man phenomenon was, was an outbreak of mass hysteria. Injuries reported by victims were either caused during panic attacks and a majority were self-inflicted. The political scientist Aditya Nigam has drawn attention to the spaces of subaltern existence, terraces, vacant lots, low-rise buildings in urban villages that Monkey Man brings to life. Others, such as Aman Sethi, foreground the splintering urbanisms that Monkey Man indexes. He writes, a city of the exhausted, distressed and restless, struggling with the uncertainties of eviction and unemployment. But there's also an infopolitical dimension to the Monkey Man phenomenon. And I'm grateful to the historian Dilip Simeon for drawing this to my attention. As events of attacks took grip and spread across Delhi, the police urged the then state-run power company, Delhi Vidyut Board, to ensure uninterrupted power supply from dawn to dusk so that panicked residents could feel safe. By the middle of May, a few weeks into the monkey man phenomenon, the number of hoax calls allegedly citing the creature went up. There were connections between citing calls and Delhi's frequent power failures. Residents called the police every time there was a power failure because they believed police would be forced to restore power before starting a search. The spectral monkey turned cyborg was being deployed by people to make infrastructural claims. By the time the number of sightings had crossed 100, over 1,500 policemen were on the streets patrolling Northeast and East Delhi alone. The shadowy creature had also brought about transformations in public provisioning of electricity as well. The Delhi Vidyut Board sprung into action, repairing street corner lights across the city that had been defunct for months, and power cuts during the night had completely stopped in many localities, and crime rates, in fact, in the metropolis had come down. Whilst mass hysteria might have manufactured the monkey man phenomenon, um, the, the phenomenon and its histrionic personas um, cannot be seen outside of the eviscerating forces that relentlessly dispossess the poor without relief or mercy. Equally, it cannot be read outside of an infra infrapolitics enacted through the virtual and the fantastic. At stake here are practices that typically go unnoticed and operate insidiously beneath the threshold of political detectability. Infrastructure, as politics in a minor mode does not exist in itself. It exists in relation to a major politics of infrastructure. Infrapolitics is an investment in the latter's laws, regulations, and technologies for making them minor. The Katyabas works to avoid detection. Creating a bypass is very different, for example, from open resistance. And it is precisely these itinerations that render his practices infrapolitical rather than subaltern. Intrapolitics, I would argue, derives from transversal and, and a heterogeneous collective, not an organized community um, and neither an assemblage of things. Sightings of monkey mans and attacks by the creature do not confront state order or challenge governors, and yet it enables making claims of infrastructure. Minor ecologies then foreground a whole other set of stories vibrating within um, what one would call the kind of major logics of infrastructural governance and assembly. And these are not always graspable in the analytics of informal urbanization 
um, especially in the way in which kind of the literature on informal urban urbanization stands. But let us return to Delhi's Connaught Place. Amidst corporate offices, banks, and high-end retail outlets is one of the city's Hanuman temples, a space attracting thousands of footfalls every day. The plaza, besides the temple, has rows of stalls selling flowers, garlands, and religious par paraphernalia. Astrologers and palm readers wait at tables for clients to come by, whilst the destitute sit at the temple entrance, relying on religious prescription and sympathy to get by amidst rampant immiseration. The space is what one might call an inadvertent commons, a space of economic make-do. Yet, as accounts of elect, um, economic assembly, yet an account of this sort of economic assembly around these spaces would remain incomplete if one ignored the ubiquitous macaques. Devotees, often instructed by priests, regularly feed the animals. Kusum, a middle-aged woman, purchases two dozen bananas every week from Akash, a vendor whose trade is contingent upon people buying fruit to feed monkeys. His makeshift stall is strategically located by the entrance of the temple, where macaques congregate to attract buyers for his commodities. And um, the, the ultimate consumers of these commodities, one could argue, are not all human. Kusum, like hundreds of other devotees visiting the Hanuman temple, initiates contact with the animals that are otherwise engrossed in their own simian doings. Feeding macaques, she says, is an act um, through which one receives punya, a cleansing merit from God, and through this dan or gift, volatile energies are harnessed for the individual's protection, fortune, and well-being. Troubles go away when you feed them, says Akash, the banana vendor. He sells over 70 bananas a day, or 70 dozen bananas a day, and more so on Tuesdays and Saturdays, days of the week continue, uh, considered to be auspicious for Hanuman worship. And whilst written out of mainstream accounts of the informal urban economy, these arrangements and improvisations involving Hanuman devotees, banana vendors, and the rhesus macaque can be thought of as infrastructural. They constitute and subtend the maintenance and reproduction of economic life. Here, Abdul Malik Simon's evocative contention of people as infrastructure provides a very helpful starting point. Simone extends the concept of infrastructure to include people's activities in the city, the forms of economic collaboration between residents seemingly marginalized from urban life. Relations become infrastructural less because of an adherence to specific rules and have more to do with the capacities of people, Simone argues, to improvise. But improvisation here in this particular instance also involves the actions of macabres. The animal increasingly realizes, uh, relies on provision food in Delhi's urban environment, even modifying their behaviors to elicit sympathetic responses in people. The groundbreaking work of the ethologist Anindya Sinha shows how macaques adopt several novel behaviors to elicit, to elicit affective responses in people. Bipedal beg begging, standing erect on their hind legs while making contact for food, is a strategy that certain animals learn to deploy, particularly when macaques and human worlds coincide. A corporeal technique mirroring their upright human counterparts, macaques generate sympathy to spark affective exchanges. Sinha's work in other parts of India shows that whilst adults might resort to scaring humans away to giving up food, younger animals waiting in the sidelines make eye contact. When the eyes of people in the macaques meet, Juveniles extend their hand, palm up, soliciting food. The gesture is sometimes punctuated with a soft poo call. And if needed, the individual orients his body to remain in the person's field of vision. The hand gesture, reported for the first time in a wild monkey, is only used by macaques for communicating with humans, but never when interacting with their own species. The coo call is unknown in the species in the wild and the origins of the gesture are unclear. Can it be that macaques saw humans reaching out for food with, e with each other, asked Sinha, that led to um, the emergence 
of this phenomenon. In certain parts of Northern India, and um, actually in fact, in, in many other parts of the world, um, in many other parts of the world, um, uh, improvisation takes on further novel um, formations. This includes a process of bartering or commodity ex exchange, a two-way traffic in things where macaques play an active role. And uh, this is a video from uh, Northern India, but you can see this individual has got a shoe, which is probably nicked uh, from a person. The animal steals items that have no direct food value, scarves, glasses, shoes, from pilgrims and temples, returning them as tokens in exchange for food. In most cases, macaques, and you can see here, macaques will only let go of the stolen object if preferred food items are furnished. Vendors, and, and, and you can see this individual is not letting go of the shoe until and unless they give him what he wants and um, he drops the shoe. So vendors and shopkeepers in these locales often know that food will entice macaques to drop stolen items and they stock these commodities for sale, nudging people to buy them so they get their valuables back. A set of economic practices take grip contingent upon barter between people and macaques. And here, macaques have an influence on the transaction of commodities in what food is bought and what is offered. In fact, this particular banana vendor in Delhi had dug a well next to his stall in order to ensure that macaques remain nearby. When Delhi's municipal corporation came to capture the animals as part of a wider scheme, to rid a world-class city of its other than human denizens, a fight between the local residents and the corporation ensued. It is precisely at such junctures, precarious commun communities standing up for vulnerable other than humans in which the infrastructural role of macaques come to the fore. But rather than couching these sort of minor infrastructures into a condition of innovation through which the poor therefore must become makers of their own destiny. Um, you know, you innovate and, and uh, get by with life. One has to kind of re remain cautious to say, well, you know, these are not, um, you know, these are not the only way to do, you know, kind of have urban lives. It, it, they must actually stand, I would argue, as reminders of the fallibility of the welfare, the failability of the welfare state and of capital that masters predatory face. So I want to quickly wrap up now. Um, so ethnographic commitments to the lift city, in this case, guided by the macaques as an unexpected flaneur, marks a point of departure in terms of how cities might be read through the infrastructure. The meshwork, affective economies, and infrapolitics show how infrastructures are much more than a structure of contact, a substrate subtending human life, or a locus of governance and avenue through which people claim citizenship. I therefore argue that the constitution, effects and promises of infrastructure are always in articulation with a sticky connection to other than human life. This is not trivial for it constitutes an overlooked dimension of urban life. When the theoretical glance is deflected from the usual suspects, we witness a whole other politics and mode of inhabitation that resonate within a city. Minor practices of the Katyabas and the itinerant geographies of macaques recast the urban landscape as alive. By inventing lines, habitat is reworked as not laid out in advance, but under continual construction, reproduced and renewed through polyvalent connections. This account of the living city is much more than simply a kind of recuperating elusive uh, the elusive vibrancy of matter, for instance, you know what one would argue with, or what the new materialists or the new vitalists argue. What such an account excavates is a far more complex suite of entities, agents, and forces, human or other than human, and a variegated set of cultural and economic practices that are formal and informal, licit and illicit, that give the city its grip. Minor practices show how heterogeneous alignments between people and macaques can become infrastructural, vital to the ways in which the urban poor improvise and reproduce their frail, dispossessed lives. At stake here, I would argue, is a co-constitution of ecology and economy. 
The interest political practices witnessed in the city operate not only beneath the threshold of political detectability, as discussed by people like um, James Scott, but they do so by summoning other than human agents, be they animals, specters, or spirits. These are not marginal phenomena of niche interest, but part of the fabric of what counts as a city. If they do not appear in the extant urban canon, it is precisely because the latter has a tendency to foreclose in advance who or what urban agents are. Infopolitics, therefore, I would argue is a diagonal politics. It also operates by summoning other agents and fantastic figures, seldom dreamt of in urban theory, but which become evident when you write infrastructure in a minor key. Thanks. Thank you very Thank much. You. So there was um, a lot of applause here. Thank you so much, Man. Um, we have some time for questions. And I think while um, some of you think of uh, what you would like to ask, um, you know, I'm, uh, well, thank you also for basically sharing, you know, this uh, fascinating world with us. Um, I was wondering whether you might be able to um, tell us a little bit about the type of field work that you were doing. I think that would be one of the things that would be um, interesting for many to, to hear about and how you actually went about uh, some of the parts of your, your study that involve the macaques uh, directly. Um, you, you're muted. Can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, yes, it, it was, you know, it, it's the sort of work that me and Anandya Sinha, my colleague, um, who, who Sonia, you've met, uh, that we're kind of trying to develop through this um, broader project, which is at a, at a kind of conjunction between ethnography and, and ecology. So the field work that I did uh, largely involved spending time in, in particular sites like, like Connaught Place, which you can actually see you know, here at the bottom of the screen and, and, and this transaction here as well between people and macaques. And it, it meant in a typical way, kind of just deep hanging out, you know, spending time in these places and, and looking at interactions. Um, but there was also a kind of ecological component to it. So I was trying to kind of follow what, what the macaques were doing um, to a certain extent we have a PhD student actually who is now looking more into the kind of ethology and, and behavior almost in a kind of pure ethology way. But it, it's this combination between, I think, um, ethnography and ecology that really brings this to the story to life, uh, to life. But of course, that is also coupled with some amount of archival work and, and you know, your typical interviews with, with uh, um, electricity supply companies and, and, and so on and so forth. But I think the, the crux was the sort of deep hanging out that really took, try to do a kind of ethnography of the macaques, um, not in a ethological study, in that sense it wasn't a quantified study, but it was a kind of immersive ethnography which tried to take into cognizance, you know, what were the macaques doing? And I think these visuals here on the screen really show for me, what was really striking was this relation between the electric wires and the and, and, and the and the animal uh, and the animals which they were constantly using to move through the city. And then I started to try and unpack, you know, what is happening with the grid. And these whole other stories start to kind of emerge. Wonderful. Thank you. Questions from um... Um, I'm curious to know if there was ever any thought that you might have heard while you're doing your research of creating maybe a new and more appealing kind of roadway per se, instead of using the wires for the monkeys. So the whole time I was thinking, why don't they just build something else that's more appealing that the monkeys will use? And not to say they wouldn't still use the wires, but there's something about the redirected attention that I'm curious about. Thanks. That's a, um, it's a very interesting question. Um, you, you know, as you've kind of 
just mentioned, you know, the the city in Delhi already has so many electric wires, and and that's because of the the nature of electrification in the city. But you know, these ready-made sort of highways are there for the animals. So I don't know whether having new structures would would really help. Where you do see these kinds of interventions are actually in, more in rural areas um, and in certain species of macaques, which are really poor, which, which are largely arboreal and, and will not say cross busy roads. Um, so when you have habitat fragmentation, there have been kind of attempts to create these sort of ropeways um, across forest patches that, that macaques might be able to use. In, in Delhi, you know, the, um, there, there are two further reasons that something like this would be shunned. One is because, you know, monkeys are an issue for a lot of residents. Um, they, they break into houses, they steal food. Monkey bites are very common. I think Delhi uh, two years ago recorded about 16,000 or so, mon no, yeah, 6,000 monkey bites. So, so there are those issues. So I, I think um, for a lot of people, it's actually about not trying to get the monkeys to come into their residences. So I think something like that, a design intervention like, like that would, would meet with um, a lot of resistance um, amongst communities. And, and secondly, where this might kind of work is when you, know, you have sort of broad roads and very um, fast traffic where, you know, and there are no electric wires, for instance, and the macaques are unable to to move. So these actually act as urban biogeographic, biogeographic um, barriers. In those instances, it might be interesting to try and put something up. But macaques actually are not a priority of the state. Um, Delhi, in the last 15 years, has caught 20,000 monkeys and have relocated them um, outside the city. They, they actually don't want you know, the, the macaque in the city. So an intervention like this would, would, wouldn't go down very well. Hi, thanks so much for coming and speaking to us. This was a really interesting presentation. My mind's kind of all over the place, but one of the questions I wanted to ask was just thinking about kind of how the pandemic has changed, how so much of our urban infrastructure is used. I was wondering uh, perhaps how macaques interactions with the urban infrastructure has changed over the course of pandemic. And if you've noticed any or had any observations in that. Um, yes, it, it's an interesting question because uh, I don't know if you've come across this term that a lot of people are beginning to use called the anthropause. Um, you know, this, this whole idea that kind of nature is now reclaiming our city because of um, you know, lockdowns stop human activity and, you know, nature is sort of coming back. That, that kind of argument or the messaging that has gone, in, gone into it. Um, and a lot of people, I think someone's coined the term anthropos, that, oh, yeah, you know, this is a moment where anthropos pauses and, and nature in, in some ways come, comes back. So what does um, the pandemic tell us about urban ecology and urban life? And I'm really kind of critical of, of that idea because in Delhi, and this is to answer your question, what we, with, what we found um, was actually the reverse. In essence, because a lot of the urban animals in the city are dependent on people provisioning for them, uh, there was a problem. So um, a lot of, when the lockdown happened in Delhi, as some of you might know, there was a mass exodus of people. Um, thousands of people kind of had to, you know, leave Delhi. It was a very, very difficult, um, difficult time in, in 2020. A lot of the banana vendors uh, left. And um, for a lot of the urban animals, in fact, cattle and stray dogs, the police gave special permission for people to go out and feed them. Um, I don't know what exactly happened in the instance of macaques, there were some reports, um, which are not verified, that you know aggression between the troops increased because food became even more clustered and, and scarce. Um, and definitely for the banana vendors, you know, who who are really at the margins of urban life, you know, they had a difficult time. Some of them left Delhi, went to parts of rural India where they were staying for months. Um, 
so that was a dynamic that you know especially in relation to macaques and and, and the city that's that's what we witnessed um in beyond that what the wider ramification is 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 really difficult difficult to tell but i think the key key theme here is 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 a critique of this idea of the anthropos because um a lot of these ecologies are actually very dependent on people, on these practices of provisioning, which are driven by philanthropy, they're driven by religious beliefs. Um, and I think, you know, those came to a halt, which I think, in at least in the initial days of the lockdown, you know, ha had an effect on their lives. Yeah. Yeah, Hi. Um, so I just started my final research paper for Sonia's class, and I'm writing about the phenomenon of dog parks in America, which is one of the quickest growing types of urban parks. And so what stood out to me is different from the macaques is that macaques are invading the city, whereas we're choosing to bring pets, um, you know, where, where the pet population's growing, a lot more pet owners in America. And so we're welcoming them in. So when it comes to the question of infrastructure and city planning being built around animals, in the case in Delhi, it's by necessity, but in situations where people are choosing to welcome animals in, would you still agree that infrastructure should be built to welcome this more sort of zoologic urban city? Yes. Um I, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of um, Philip Howell, um, who's my colleague in Cambridge, who's written a fascinating book on, on, on the kind of, on the Victorian dog. And he, you know, one of his arguments is that with, with the, in the Victorian age, you actually see the, the birth of the pet, of the pet dog, you know? So his argument was the actually that the normal of whatever you want to call it, I'm just using a shorthand, but the normal urban dog was actually a kind of free living um, street dog that you might say see, see in a place like Delhi. And in the Victorian age, you know, there is this sort of invention of the pet. And with that, he argues, is also the, the rise of the dog walking city. Um, and he, he's written this lovely chapter on, um, you know, the muzzle and the lead. And he calls it the conduct of conduct of conduct, you know, in, in that Foucauldian sense. Is not just the conduct of conduct, but the way the dog must conduct itself. And he shows, in fact, how dog walking and these sort of spaces began to emerge in this particular period. Um, in Delhi, I'm mean, just on the topic of dogs. It's very interesting because Delhi, I think, has three to five hundred thousand street dogs. I mean, there's no exact measure of numbers, but that's what they say. Dog bites are very common. So there's about 60,000 dog bites reported every year. And at the same time, uh, what's happening is there's a huge boom in, in, the, um, in the pet dog industry, in the pet animal industry, from food to veterinary care uh, to you know, breeds and so on and so forth. And in a city like Delhi, it's very, the, the very practice of dog dog walking is, 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 is interesting because when people take their dogs out to walk in, in parks, you know, you have the street dogs that sometimes gang up and, and so on and so forth and, and the dogs start barking. And um, so in that instance, I think creating a kind of, you know, what does infrastructure mean? I mean, I'm, I'm using a very different context to, to the one you're talking about. Um, and I think in a context like you know, in, in North America, I'm, I'm not familiar firsthand, but I think, yes, of course, um, having green spaces and, you know, um, especially if you think that, well, you know, how would dogs live? I think it's really vital for urban planning to, to make sure that, you know, these spaces are available for dogs to, to exercise and, and to be able to, to go out um, because that figure is a kind of, Victorian invention in, in many ways, right? But if you think of a place like Delhi and the creation of infrastructures for, for dogs, I think must then therefore also take into account the street dog, uh, which are partly owned, partly kind of, you know, um, independent. They have very interesting relations with people on the streets. 
um, and a lot of people care for them. And I think the question of then having green parks for dog walking, I think, shouldn't become this sort of typical moment you see with urban gentrification, right? That um, let's now have parks where people can walk their fancy breeds and, you know, any other people who use these spaces and the street dogs that might use these spaces now have to be kind of evicted and, and cleared. I think there's it's, there's a double-edged kind of sword to something like that in Delhi. Definitely. Um, Thanks so much. Other questions? So I'm wondering, um, you mentioned there's also dogs in Delhi and with the monkeys and um, also I, I've been doing it, there's many cows <laughs> in the street as well. And so I'm just wondering like um, in terms of just kind of the pedestrian network, like or just the network of the city, like how do all these animals, I guess, interact or like besides the the monkeys, like how, I, sorry, I'm not articulating this that well, but I'm just curious, like how the animals all interact and like what ecologies um, or infrastructure are being created for the other animals. Mm, um, I mean, the, the the stray dog or the street dog is one figure, the macaque and, and cattle, yes. In fact, in my forthcoming book, I have kind of two chapters on, on cattle in the city. I was following some cows and looking at how they graze, um, which is very interesting because actually owners just sort of let, let the cows lose and, and they know where to go, where to negotiate, you know, where to get water, where to get food and, and so on and so forth. Um, but I think... If I kind of understand you correctly, what what are the kind of ecological relations that emerge? Uh, with macaques, it's interesting because you don't have urban predators anymore, right? So in rural areas, these macaques would be maybe preyed, by, preyed upon by um, leopards, uh, maybe occasionally tigers. But in urban areas, they, they don't have predators. So therefore, I think um, that's certainly one ecological aspect. Uh, street dogs have an effect on the kind of wider wild ecology of the city. Um, so I have a colleague who, who works on urban jackals. Jackals are kind of canids um, that, that were present in Delhi, very persecuted in colonial times, but they, they remain in, in certain pockets of the city. And because of street dog presence, um, jackals have really taken to shifting, have shifting and foraging really late at night. So you see a kind of temporal segregation of the city where street dogs are active from, say, six or seven in the evening, depending on you know, whether it's summer or winter, till the middle of the night. And, and the jackals become active after that because there's competition for the dogs and jackals for food. So you see that kind of effect. Um, but yes, these, these are in many ways anthropogenic, or I would actually call them kind of post-colonial fauna, which are really, you know, the, the lives of macaques or street dogs are inherently linked up to the kind of metabolic environment of the city. Um, but what you also see in cities is actually not the whole gamut of relation, you know, ecological relations that you might see in, in, a, in, in a forest landscape, right? Uh, hey, Mon, thank you for this. It's been wonderful. Um, we had an editorial um, a couple of years back in LA, LA Plus that talked about the golden tamarind, um, an endangered species, and how the urban environment might be a perfect place um, to actually help their populations grow. And I'm wondering, do you think that with greater intentionality to these infrastructures, um, we could actually um, do a better job of living harmoniously with the other animals? Um, so, so sorry, was it was a question about Im improving infrastructures to enable? Yeah, uh, I guess I'm, I'm curious. Do you think that with 
greater intentionality um, of this infrastructure, it could be helpful for, I don't wanna say endangered species, but other species. Yes, I think there's been kind of several attempts to try and design with, with animal life, right? And I think animal friendly design or ecologically friendly design is an important step. Uh, the instance that I've been talking about is actually kind of, it's, there's an unintention, unintentional kind of aspect to this infrastructure, right? That they, they foster all other kinds of relations that are never even conceived of when they put in. So they exceed script. But um, I think it's, it's, it's really vital. And just to give you an example, I've been doing some field work in the city called Gohati, where there's an endangered species of stork. Uh, it's globally endangered, called the greater adjutant stork. And it forages in waste dumps in the city. And that brings you know, some very interesting tensions um, to the fore because yes, you, know, you don't want open landfills next to residential areas, but on the other hand, you have a stalk that kind of thrives in, in, in these spaces uh, and, and what happens as a result. So I think some very interesting tensions around questions of waste disposal, you know, conserving endangered birds and so on and so forth come to the foreground. Um, I don't know if it quite addresses your question, but I think, yes, you know, you can think of building more ecologically friendly infrastructure, designing for animals. Um, some of it will, of course, be kind of, will always exceed infrastructure script, like, like you see here. But then you also have situations where, you know, um, what other than human life need can be at kind of loggerheads with general urban sanitation and, and, and planning and so on and so forth. So I think there's a whole kind of series of things that you need to look at in the spectrum, but it's a very interesting question, yes. Thank you. I think we have time perhaps for one or two more questions, if there are any, yes. Hi. Um... One of the things that was really interesting to me in this talk was just how macaques are such a big part of the social fabric of the city. And my question is about just what you think of the feasibility and also the ethics of maybe training macaques to provide urban services, such as, for example, picking up litter or just, you know, like just thinking about social programs and just opportunities to have um, macaques be almost like participants in society in a way that benefits people, but also like creates better relationship between humans and macaques. Yeah. I think something like that would be, would be really difficult. In fact, impossible to achieve. Right. And, um, it's kind of Foucauldian logic to trying to kind of discipline, you know, the macaque into the ruly urban citizen or urban denizen. Um, and with these animals, you, you really cannot, um, you know, cannot do that. Um, in certain instances, I think some, some species of Indians had a, big problem with the kind of extinction of vultures, but you know, there are uh, kites in the city which perform an important role in terms of disposing um, garbage in the, in the sense that they, they scavenge. So therefore there's a kind of ecosystem role that certain, certain birds, probably crows and, and kites play. With the macaques, it, it's, it's, it's very difficult. I think what is really important is that people learn to cultivate certain ways of living with with the macaques that are not antagonistic. Um, the approach of the state, as I had said earlier, was just to try and catch these and take them away. But all you end up doing is moving the problem around. Uh, you, you don't solve the problem. I think with, with, in case of people, um, at the most is you kind of cultivate a certain relationship where there's less an antagonism. Um, and hopefully, you know, there's less kind of aggression from, from the macaques. And, the way that can be done is very 
very difficult to kind of prescribe. But um, the, just to give you an example, the banana vendor, um, whose image I think I showed uh, uh, earlier, you know, he said the macaques don't do anything to him, um, which is very interesting. They, you know, people will often, um, he often keeps a stick, you can see in this image, just to make sure that the monkeys don't uh, take the bananas away and to shoo them away, but he's never been bitten. And uh, so he's learned to cultivate a particular kind of relation. And I think that is what um, becomes quite important. But, you know, you can't get them to be service providers. You know, they, they cannot become the kind of governmentalized animal, um, urban citizen the way we want to <laughs> think of doing that. <laughs> There's actually some um, fruit and refreshments under the tent for all of us um, upstairs. I'm super curious, and this is any more questions from your side? Then I'll kind of pose, I'll take the advantage of and pose one last question. Um, you mentioned that um, the aesthetics about the arboreal um, cityscape in, in Delhi, and that that was also something that you um, were interested in. Uh, is, is that correct? And I was wondering. Uh, if... Yeah, so, so there's a politics of aesthetics here. Um, my interest is, is not so much to do with the aesthetic, aesthetics, I think, around, I mean, I love the electric wires, and uh, although, you know, initially I was sort of a bit spellbound by it, a lot of, so there is this vision in, of governance in Delhi, and some people like, say, um, J. Asher Gertner make the argument that, um, you know, um, the politics of governing the city in, in a place like in, in Delhi actually is is not the kind of biopolitical regime that you know that you would associate with many cities in the West, but it's a politics of aesthetics, whether you know it has to do with slum clearances and so on and so forth. Populations are not always calculated, they're not always governed in the same way. It has to do with establishing particular aesthetic orders of the city. Um, and you see the same logic that happens with, with macaques. So the idea is that Delhi is a global capital. You know, cattle on the streets is bad. You know, having thousands of monkeys roaming around in this muck is bad. And therefore, the state intervenes to try and capture, to, to, to remove cattle from the city. They're trying, trying to do this since about 1910. And with the macaques, they've also been capturing them since, since about the 70s. But it escalated after Delhi's mayor died in 2001, if I remember correctly, uh, where they've caught 20,000 monkeys, but haven't been able to solve what they call the monkey menace. So I think there is a politics of aesthetics, uh, especially in the way in which the state um, tries to intervene and, and regulate, not regulate, but actually remove um, monkeys from the city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. It is a politics of aesthetics entirely. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Okay, well, thanks so much, Man, for us getting up so early, and I hope you can get some more sleep. Um, <laughs> what, what time is it? It kind of, must be kind of between four or five or something, your time. Um, ten, ten to five, yeah. Yes, yeah. So thank you so much for taking that. Not at all. And getting up. Thank you. It's a great, <laughs> it's a great, great pleasure. Yeah. Um, thank you for all Thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Yay. Cheers. <laughs> okay.